Welcome to Boston. Can you imagine a better way to arrive in a new city? The airport's just a couple of miles over there. Then this water taxi will take you straight to the heart of one of America's most fascinating cities. $10, eight minutes to make the perfect start for 48 hours in Boston and beyond. There are three main ways from Boston Airport into town, the taxi, the bus or the subway. But for my money, this is the ideal way to arrive at one of America's great cities. Boston is a beautiful, compact muddle. To the east, you have the airport. The south is the seaport district gradually being improved. Over to the west, you've got the financial district and historic Beacon Hill to the north, the cradle of American independence, the North End. This handsome property first opened in 1851, and for most of its life, all the guests have stayed for free. But they've been entirely male and really not very happy. That's because the Liberty Hotel was originally the Charles Street Jail. The architects who transformed this place into a luxury hotel didn't take liberties with the original structure. This used to be where drunks were incarcerated overnight. Now it's a bar called Alibi. I suspect that the original prisoners perhaps wouldn't recognise their old cells. It is though the original brickwork. And if you want to be alone, there's a do not disturb sign with a difference. A night in this very comfortable slammer starts at around $500. Luckily, there's plenty of less expensive options, such as here in the South End Historic District. This is the perfectly pleasant Chandler Inn. Now, hotel rates in Boston, like anywhere else in the United States, depend on demand. And this will cost you anywhere between $220 and $250 a night, including those pesky taxes. Now, this isn't quite the view that you'll be getting from your window, but it is a very safe and very central area with a very comfortable bed. The city of Boston makes it marvellously easy to take a hike through the story of American independence, thanks to the Freedom Trail, a two and a half mile walk that begins here at the Visitor Information Centre on Boston Common. Good news for me today, I've got a guide, and here she is. Hello. Good morning. I'm Simon, and you must be? I'm Mary Clapham. I must say that us Brits are just a little bit rusty on the very important story of American independence. So you're going to make it easy for me? I'll make it as easy as I can. And understandably, you had a lot going on yourselves at the time, I understand. And we think everything has turned out marvelously. And I hope everybody likes what we've done with your town. Boston Common itself was location for some unhappy events perpetrated by the Puritans. Whippings, uh, pillorying's, and even hangings for all those who did not um, comply with the code of conduct that everyone was expected to stick with. Next stop, the Meeting House, where on the 16th of December 1773, the American revolutionaries planned a tea party aboard three British ships in Boston Harbor. Samuel Adams stood up at the end of the meeting and said, gentlemen, this meeting can do no more to save our country. After the meeting closed, the Sons of Liberty went into action, boarded the ships, threw the tea into the harbor, and many date the actual revolution from that act. King George certainly saw it that way. The Old State House, another critical location. Now that balcony is a very famous place. On July the 18th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was first read to the people of Boston and they celebrated by tearing down the lion and the unicorn, symbols of Britain. <laughs> but a few uh, hundred years later on our nation's bicentennial, July the 4th, 1976, Queen Elizabeth herself took part in the annual reading of the Declaration on July the 4th. 
And at that time, she was presented with a check for $35,000. Well, we still owed her for the tea, you know. Here's an important man on his horse. His name you may have heard of, Paul Revere, but you may not be absolutely certain what he's famous for. Mary? He's mostly known uh, because of a poem that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote on the eve of the American Civil War. He told the story of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Revere was a messenger for the Committee of Safety who was sent out to the towns of Lexington and Concord to warn the militia that redcoats were on their way to Lexington to arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams and to Concord to seize a hold of some military supplies. There is where the shot heard round the world that started the American Revolutionary War was fired. And it was all downhill from there, from the British point of view. If you need to rest your tired legs along the Freedom Trail, then this is the place to do it. A beautiful garden beside the Old North Church, which is an important part of the Paul Revere story. Paul Revere had arranged for a signal of lanterns to be hung in the steeple of the church. He knew that from the steeple you could see over to Charlestown where the militia would be waiting to find out which way the redcoats would be leaving Boston by the land route or being ferried across the river to Cambridge. So on that night two lanterns were hanged up there in the steeple letting the Charlestown militia know that the, uh, they could expect to find the soldiers marching from Cambridge. Here we are at Bunker Hill Monument. Mary, it's the end of the Freedom Trail. Is it the end of the independent story? Well, certainly not, but this does mark the site of the final battle of the American Revolution that was fought here in New England. It was here that the revolutionary commander, Colonel Prescott, told his troops, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Best of all, you can climb to the very top of the Bunker Hill Monument, 221 feet, which is what I'm going to do. And let's see how long it takes. Oh, starting now. This virtuous spiral leads to a splendid panorama of America's revolutionary metropolis. Ah, eight minutes, three seconds, 294 steps there and back. A wonderful, wonderful opportunity, but it's time for lunch. I've just spent $15 on a cab ride to Boston's alter ego, the town of Cambridge. This is the home of Harvard University, and I want to find out where really brainy people have their lunch. This is Mr. Bartley's Burger Cottage. That is Mr. Bartley. And you can see from the line stretching down the street that this is a very good place to have your lunch. Uh, Joe Bartley, yeah. the legendary Joe Bartley, <laughs> who started this in 1960. 1960, it was a grocery store. I can't believe it. And yeah. here you are still working away. Yeah, just a couple hours a day. Go on, you know you want to be here too. Have you ever seen anything like this? I am astonished that they can pack in so many people. The kitchen over there is working 19 to the dozen. No sign of my food yet, but frankly, I'm having a great time just looking at all the memorabilia for half a century of feeding very brainy people. The burgers are named after celebrities, such as the Mark Zuckerberger, after the founder of Facebook. It's a very social network here. Oh, and you have to pay in cash. The motto is real food, real money. I don't think I ever want to eat anywhere else. That was just great. And just as this is a very individual place, Mr. Bartley's Burger Cottage, so Cambridge is full of very individual shops. Whether you want to buy words by the million in one of the many great bookshops, or you want to find a one in a million piece of art, then Cambridge is a great place to be. It's also going to be somewhere you can find that hat you've always wanted, or if you're in the market for clothes, find anything you want to tax free up to $175. And remember, if you want to spend more than $175 on an item of clothing, you're spending too much. You don't need to. 
But my favorite place to shop has to be the garage. Guess what? It used to be a garage, and now it is full of all sorts of fascinating one-off independent shops. You can buy a Lucky Charm, acquire a tattoo, or find something made from hemp, the kind you don't smoke. It's very easy, I've found, to work up a thirst in Boston. Luckily, it's also very easy to quench that thirst because I think it is the beer capital of the United States. And every Saturday, 10.30 till 5, you can take a tour here of the Harpoon Brewery. I think patience and the love of the beer is the secret to a good beer. The Harpoon motto, love beer, love life, Harpoon. Uh, you know, that, that's what Rich and Dan were really trying to accomplish when they started a, a Harpoon. It was just their love of beer, good beer, and they wanted to bring it back to the U.S. with the, with the neighborhood in Boston and, and, and now all over the country. So here's one company that can organize a party in a brewery, and it's not a Boston tea party. But the Harpoon Brewery's only been going for a quarter century. And if you like a little more history with your beer, then you could come here to the Bell in Hand, the oldest tavern not just in Boston, but in America. And if you're lucky, you might get to meet Deborah Sanson, otherwise known as Judith in real life, but somebody who knows a great deal about drinking around this great city. The Freedom Trail Foundation offers pub crawls in the Faneuil Hall Marketplace area. We go to four or five of the most historic pubs that you have not only in Boston, but in the United States of America. And at each of these pubs, we get to hear the stories of the people who founded these taverns and what they were going through during the Revolutionary Era, the Victorian Era. And we, we have beer, Samuel Adams provides it himself, and we have food and we sing and we have a great time. Many more pubs are available, but it's time to eat. I'm off to find where Peru meets Italy. The heat is on in the north end between about 100 ooh, Italian restaurants all competing, but I bet, thank you, you have never seen a menu like this. It's really where Machu Picchu merges with the Amalfi Coast. So I've ordered a couple of pasta dishes. One of them fairly ordinary. That is New England lobster and crab ravioli. The other quite extraordinary. Gnocchi made with yucca and with a delicious lamb ragu. Come to Taranta for intercontinental eating in this most deliciously multicultural of cities. Morning, I'm in the chic and cheerful Back Bay district of Boston and this is the spiritual hub. It's the Old South Church, or strictly the new Old South Church, the third location to serve the congregation since 1669. Now, it's just before 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, which means that it's time for the signature service to begin. And we're all invited. Good morning. Good morning, welcome. Nice to nice see you. Nice to see you. Thank you, sir. The motto here is life's too short for long-faced religion. The church opened a decade after the American Civil War ended, a time of hope and, dare I say it, some ecclesiastical extravagance that helped create a northern Italian Gothic masterpiece in New England's biggest city. After that inspiring ceremony, I took the chance to talk to the senior minister, Nancy Taylor. We love visitors. We are the Church of the Open Door. We are a house of prayer for many nations and peoples, visited seven days a week, free to the public. We're always open. We were the first church to ordain an African-American in this country in 1783, the first church to ordain a woman in 1853. It, it's a part of who we understand God to be. God is, we say that, that God hasn't stopped speaking with the Bible, but God is still speaking, and so we're still listening. So much for nourishing the soul, time now to feed the body. I've come to Stephanie's on Newbury, and Newbury Street is a little bit like Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. The speciality here on a Sunday afternoon 
is the Bloody Mary. You can design your own. Now, I've found from experience that the best way to get the ideal meal is to ask the waiter or waitress. There's only one thing better than that, and that's to ask the executive chef. Here is Cory Como, who is the uh, executive chef here at Stephanie's on Newbury Street. What should I be eating for my Sunday brunch today? Well, I think you should probably start out with the frittered French toast. It's a great way to start for the table. Uh, we make it in-house, it's brioche bread, uh, raspberry jam, mascarpone cheese mixed in with uh, cream cheese and, and vanilla, and it's just gorgeous. And then we, we dip it in uh, fritter batter and deep fry it. So it's like a warm jelly brioche donut. Can't beat that to start. And then a, a nice crab cake Benedict, which is our take on a, on a classic. Uh, we take our jumbo lump crab meat, uh, crab cakes, and then we put two poached eggs on top and then serve that with greens and, and home fried potatoes and it's just delicious. And then I'm carried out of here, am I? That's, we, we have wheelbarrows up back for everybody so we can take them back to their cars or back to their hotels or wherever they need to go. I'm feeling very, very hungry already. Thank you. Good, you're welcome. Brunch is served every Sunday from 10 till 3. Book a table in advance for what's described as sophisticated comfort food. So, how to walk off a feast like that? Well, luckily, Boston has more than the usual civic complement of parks and gardens. It's got an emerald necklace. Nine parks strung out on a seven mile trail around the west of the city, like green gems. You know Central Park in New York? Well, Frederick Law Olmsted was just practicing when he created that Manhattan green space. He then put his talents to work in Boston, which in the second half of the 19th century had more than its fair share of swamps and sewage issues. The emerald necklace makes up half of Boston's parkland and the lady in charge is Julie Crockford. Olmsted had such a vision for the role that parks play in a city. He said parks are necessary for our health, for our mental health, our spiritual health, and our physical health, all three. And if it was important in the 19th century when people were working in factories and working six and a half hour days, it is just as important today when people are behind computer screens and working inside and tied to little blackberries and, and iPads and so forth. So I would say that that r rationale is just as vital today. We need the respite and it's a respite for people from all walks of life. The parks are for everyone. And if you delve a little within the park, well, I can promise you a rose garden. Boston has many great ways to get around. It's a wonderful walking city. It's got America's original subway. And now it also has the Hubway. This is a bicycle rental scheme. There's stations like this right across the city. And $5 will buy you 24 hours of unlimited rides as long as you get where you're going in half an hour. In a city with deep history and with some citizens with deep pockets, no wonder Boston has some cultural treats in store. If you wonder what the great architect Renzo Piano designed immediately before the Shard in London, well, it was this, the extension to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the place where, if you've only got time to visit one cultural attraction, this is the place to go. And if you happen to be named Isabella, or it's your birthday, there's another reason to go. You'll get in free. Light and nature, architecture and art. Isabella Stewart Gardner was a woman of remarkable taste. Hello, I'm up here. The highlight of Renzo Piano's work is this amazing concert hall. And the idea is that unlike traditional auditoria, it is vertical. Every seat on these upper levels is a front seat. And the acoustics are designed so that the sound will fill the chamber magnificently. There really isn't a bad seat in this house. So see if you can stretch your cultural afternoon to a cultural evening. But if you prefer a rhapsody in the blue waters of Boston Harbour, go island hopping. 
The island I'm heading for now used to be a right old site, the unsavoury backyard of the city of Boston. Now, Spectacle Island is a delight. Elliot Higger is park ranger here. Spectacle Island used to look like a pair of spectacles or glasses. It was a garbage dump, actually. It was a garbage facility for just about 40 years. And then there was a process in Boston called the Big Dig. They used a third of that dirt, which is 6.3 million tons, all the dirt from the Ted Williams Tunnel, and capped off Spectacle and shaped it into what you see today. It's great. A lot of folks from Boston come out. Some of them say, I've been living here for 20 years and I've never been out there. And then other folks say, I've been living here for 20 years and I never know it existed. So a lot of people come out and they really enjoy themselves. There's a lot of hiking. There's five miles of hiking trails, taking people kayaking or teaching them about plants and edibles and history and culture and people, all sorts of things. If you're taking the long haul to the fine city of Boston, you've got to visit Spectacle Island. It'd be short-sighted not to. Back in Boston, what do British visitors make of the city and its people? Coming here and listening to them, they're so enthusiastic about their, their general history of uh, how they broke away from the United Kingdom. It's very easy to walk around, uh, very easy to find your way about. It's just very interesting and it's a fun place too. I'm going one step beyond Boston on a fast ferry to the past, to an historic port that was once the richest place in America and notorious for witchcraft trials, but only for a spell. The fast ferry runs from May to October and takes just 45 minutes to reach Salem. Would you believe there's even free Wi-Fi on board? It's magic. Thank you, Captain. I haven't just come here on a witch hunt. There's much more to Salem than that. But the mass hysteria that swept through the town in 1692 is a very important part of Salem's and America's history. Dozens of people accused of witchcraft. 19 people hung and poor old Giles Corey pressed to death. That would spoil your day. I squeezed in a chat with Stacey Tilney of the Salem Witch Museum. In early 1692, two young girls become inexplicably ill. And when the community can't figure out what is, you know, physically wrong with these girls, they decide it must be the devil at work. So once they figure that out, they want to know, well, how did the devil get in? Who is bewitching these young girls? So the girls start accusing people that they, whose names they know. People are still interested in finding out what happened here in the 17th century and um, why is that still sort of in our consciousness today? It still happens today. You can also visit the former home of Judge Jonathan Corwin, where some of the first accusations of witchcraft may have been made. The documents here speak of a less tolerant age. Salem first started profiting from the paranormal in the early 1970s when the TV series Bewitched filmed here. 21st century Salem has a thriving community of witches and half a dozen witchcraft shops. You can choose your favourite from Witch Witch magazine. The story of Salem unfolds through the centuries. This is Chestnut Street, the very first planned street in America, laid out at the end of the 18th century, exactly 60 feet across and lined with beautiful New England mansions. The highlight of a visit to Salem is the Peabody Essex Museum, which tells the story of how a young America became connected with the rest of the world through remarkable voyages via the Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn, to the East Indies. This oceanic World Wide Web is celebrated at what's one of the most startling museums in America. To find out more about Salem's power and wealth, I talked to Dr. Dan Finnamore, the museum's curator of maritime art and history. The mariners were very self-aware. They knew exactly what the significance of their voyages was for America. Uh, Salem was a very prominent city. It had the most prominent um, a custom house bringing in incredible wealth and they recognized that these voyages would redefine 
who Americans were on the world stage, and they wanted to bring in representations of the outside world to Americans. If you've ever wondered what an 18th century house from the Yongwei province of China looks like, just come here to New England. Every stone, every piece of timber was imported piece by piece from the ancient Orient. It's America's oldest museum in continuous operation. And after all that heavy duty sightseeing, time for a light meal. All your seafood dreams come true down by Salem's waterside at Finn's. These perfectly presented dishes with fresh local seafood, oysters, tuna. If you'll excuse me, I have to start eating right now. Oyster, wasabi, vodka. <laughs> Well, I don't think I need a crystal ball to predict that I'm going to be back in Salem soon. It's a wizard destination. Boston and the coast of Massachusetts has long been America's window on the world. And as I hope you'll agree, it makes for a great long weekend. But if you can afford a bit more time, then it's a great place to begin a longer exploration of the USA. Not least because this is where the American dream began. Would you believe there's even free Wi-Fi on board? Oh, I forgot the punchline. <laughs> it's our first day. <laughs> I don't need a... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard the Salem Ferry. My name is Captain Paul. I'm your operator today. The hotel has a do not disturb sign with a difference. That's the wrong way around. Ha 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 